Come into the circle of love and justice. Come into the community of mercy, holiness, and health. Come and you shall know peace and joy. I'm the Reverend Anthony Johnson, and I welcome you to this virtual worship service of the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg. Because we cannot meet in the church building, there are program changes, including new programs, to strengthen and serve members and friends of the church during this time of physical distancing. Every Sunday, there is a virtual coffee hour live from 11.30 a.m. until 1 p.m. Please read news you can use and other emails you receive from the church, and please check the website regularly for updates. Please note the times when the minister is available via Zoom for you to check in and talk. Please send your joy or sorrow via the link in the email you received and indicate whether you give permission for it to be read during the next Sunday's service. If you are a visitor or newcomer today, I invite you to explore the website uchbg.org to learn about the church and its many activities. A reminder for church members, there's a congregational meeting online this afternoon, beginning at 1 p.m. All voting members should have received an email this morning with the link they need to join the meeting. To all watching or listening, I say, whoever you are, wherever you live, whomever you love, whatever you do for a living, you are welcome at the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg. I invite those of you at home to light a chalice, a candle, whatever you choose to serve as your chalice at home. We light the chalice as a light to guide our going and coming, as a symbol of the warmth of welcome, as a flame to light up the world beyond that we already know, and a hearth around which we gather as a community. Love is the spirit of this congregation, and service is our gift. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to speak our truths in love, and to help one another. Please join me in singing our opening hymn, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In. is a reading, the poetry of Oliver Legrone called Sun Coming. Fireblade, flame scimitars cutting edge of copper molten red peeped 
climbed up the nights, surrounded by, followed, over, up, was led in court procession, cloud changings, burnt orange, yellow, shed, took on new hues, as east into her eye we sped, cloud ranges, zigzag, higher zones, with heavy, childlike, charcoal, scrawls, lateral, angry, erratic, dark, till brazen, full seething, stark. Naked, horizon free, the glowed fireball alone. Majestic center of radiant fury, giver and taker supreme. Dispelled them all sounded, the hammered symbols call, the burning blast our eyes begin. Dazzled, withering, turned in pain away. From look at splendor's pure array, so quickly turning African night to cloudless, blazing tropic day. Good morning. For those of you who do not know me, I am Amy Firestein, the UCH RE Committee Chair and current RE Coordinator. I want to start off today by asking how many of you have heard someone utter the phrase, well look at that, I've learned something new today. I must admit that I myself have used those very words on many an occasion. If we stop and think about it, we are always learning, and it might be something simple or more complex, and that goes for all of us not just those of you still in school. There are many stories out there that are written to teach us a value or moral. Some of these stories we have heard many times before, and I think that part of learning is sometimes being reminded of the simple things, and that includes listening to stories we have heard time and time again. After all, hearing something once doesn't mean it's going to stay with us. Sometimes hearing it twice or even three times, it's more likely to remain with us. We might even learn something new from those stories. And sometimes just hearing them again reminds us what we have learned from them the first time around and allows us to make use of those lessons once again. So today I am going to retell two classic fables, both originally told by a man named Aesop who lived thousands of years ago. The first of Aesop's fables I will read to you today is the story of the lion and the mouse. One day, a mouse happened to run over the paws of a sleeping lion. Angrily, the mighty beast woke and seized the offender. He was about to crush the little animal when the mouse cried out, Please, mighty monarch, spare me! I would be only a tiny mouthful, and you would not relish me. Besides, I might be able to help you one day. You never can tell. The idea that this insignificant creature could ever help him amused the lion so much that he let his little prisoner go. Sometime after this, the lion, roaming through the forest for food, was caught in a hunter's net. The more he struggled, the more he became entangled. His roar of rage echoed through the forest. Hearing the sound, the mouse ran to the trap and began to gnaw at the ropes that bound the lion. It was not long before he had severed the last cord with his little teeth and set the huge beast free. The moral of this fable is, don't belittle little things. A friend in need is a friend indeed, no matter how small he may be. Many of us have heard this story before, and I think it's an important story, because we should always be reminded that we should never dismiss someone because of their size. And it also reminds us that one good turn deserves another. If someone does you a kindness, we can always find a way to repay them later on with another act of kindness. The reason I chose this story, story is to remind us that everyone is important and that no act of being useful should ever go unrewarded. And now for the second tale I will retell. It's Aesop's cl classic fable, The Hare and the Tortoise. A hare was boasting about his speed and sneering at a tortoise because he was so slow. One day the tortoise said, You may laugh at me. But if we ever had a race, I know I could beat you. <laughs> Ridiculous! 
laughed the hare. Is it? asked the tortoise. We shall see. Are you ready? They started up at once, and of course the hare quickly outran the tortoise, who merely cr crawled along. The hare, in fact, was so far ahead that he treated the whole matter as a joke and lay down. I'll take a nap here in the grass, he said to himself, and when I wake, I'll finish the race far ahead. Nevertheless, the hare overslept, and when he arrived at the finish line, the tortoise, who had plodded steadily along, was there ahead of him. The moral of this story is, the race is not always to the swift. Slow and steady is sure to win. Just because you are fast doesn't mean you will win. And those who boast about being the best are sometimes cut down a few pegs and shown that just because they have won a few times doesn't mean they will always win. Taking your time can sometimes be your greater reward. The reason I told this story is that I am trying to do my best to take things a little slower and not be in such a rush to get everything done on my to-do list in one day, at least work-wise. It's something that my company has really been talking about very recently, the idea that we need to find a good home-work balance for those of us who are working from home. It's a good lesson to remember. Because just because we have all the resources to work from home and the tasks keep piling up doesn't mean we have to race to get them done in a single day and ignore our own personal needs. Take a few minutes and act like the tortoise, slow and steady. The work will get done, but you don't need to complete it at the expense of your own welfare. So I hope that you leave today's service having learned something new, or even been reminded of old lessons, whether it be from stories told by our service leaders sharing their own experiences, or from stories you may have heard before.
Today in this congregation, someone is hurting or in sorrow. Today in this congregation, someone is anxious about events in the world. Today in this congregation, someone is lonely. Today in this congregation, someone is filled with joy and wants to celebrate. For in spite of all the fear and sorrow in the world, there are still moments of joy. Let us reflect on what joys and sorrows each of us carries and holding in our hearts those whom we know are troubled or we know are celebrating and know that we share in them the trust of this community and trust in the continuity of life. When there is birth, life goes on. When there is death, life goes on. When there is joy, life goes on. When there is sorrow, life goes on. May we always live in trust and in love that all joy might be shared and all sorrow comforted. This is our prayer. Amen and blessed be.
Today is Oliver Legron Sunday at the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg. Oliver Legron was a visual artist, primarily a sculptor, a poet, and an educator. He was born in 1906 and died in 1995. As a young man from Oklahoma, attending Howard University, he had to leave after one year because the family finances suffered after his father's death. He went back to Oklahoma to work and then attended the University of Santa Fe in New Mexico, where he received a bachelor's degree with a major in sociology and a minor in fine arts. He had already begun sculpting the native wood of his home state. He then went to Detroit, where he lived in and where he studied at the Cranbrook Academy of the Arts. But while living in Detroit for many years, he also worked at Ford's River Rouge Auto Plant, taught in the Detroit public schools, and sold pots and pans door to door. While not by any means a radical, he was a civil rights advocate and lost one job because of his activism. As a middle-aged man, he studied special education at Wayne State University in Detroit. And while teaching in Detroit, he published his first book of poetry. With the encouragement of the comedian Dick Gregory, he began a new career as a guest lecturer at colleges and universities, eventually moving to Harrisburg, where he taught both at the university and primary school levels. And while he lived in Harrisburg, he was a member of this church. And through the generosity of a donation of a sculpture for sale, the church established a college scholarship fund for high school seniors in Harrisburg. After Legron's death, it was renamed in his honor as the Oliver Legron Scholarship. From this very brief summary of Legron's life, it should be clear that wherever he was in his life, worker, teacher, student, artist, from childhood to old age, however substantial his achievements in several fields, at every stage he was still learning. It seems to me that all of us always have to be at every age still learning. It seems to me that I always have to keep learning just not to fall behind. When I say fall behind, I'm not talking about educational credentials or money. One piece of Legron's life that resonates for me is how in middle age, he went back to school to study special education. He had worked since he was a child, but he would learn a new way to work and continue to be a responsible and self-supporting adult, even as he practiced not one, but two of the fine arts, poetry and sculpture. It would be comforting if I could now tell some stories about lives enriched by ongoing learning. None of you would likely disagree with the value of ongoing learning, and some of you might even feel inspired by stories in addition to that of Oliver Legron. But life right now is not that simple. Watching the news from Minneapolis and seeing images of police officer Derek Chauvin kneeling on George Floyd's neck on Memorial Day, killing him, I'm wondering if the people of the United States have learned anything since I became conscious of racialized violence as a teenager in the 1960s. The Watts civil uprising, what the mainstream media calls a riot, shocked me. I lived in an economically and racially diverse neighborhood in a small city where there were, to be sure, racial tensions. One of my three closest friends growing up was African American, and his younger cousins were the same ages as and friendly with two of my younger sisters. 
I learned about racial prejudice from the experiences of my friend in the neighborhood and from other black schoolmates. I wrote a poem about the Watts riot. The advisor for the high school literary magazine approved it for publication and also a poem I had written in praise of Malcolm X. But the principal of the high school pulled the poem about Watts. You see, it included the word ass, as in broken ass and broken glass. And Mr. Rename told me this was not acceptable parlor language. But I don't want to talk about what I've done. I want to talk about what I've observed. Boston, 1968. The assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis and the civil uprising, called riots by the media, in Roxbury. Boston's black neighborhood several miles from the campus of Boston University. I participated in several demonstrations and marches and one peaceful march downtown turned violent. I abhorred the violence and was quite honestly scared. Boston, 1974, the beginning of school desegregation. I was beginning my studies for the ministry and had recently worked for a year at a community health center in one of Boston's whitest working class neighborhoods. There was violence in the white neighborhoods of Charlestown where I had worked, South Boston and Hyde Park. Students at the Boston University School of Theology volunteered as monitors to ride the school buses taking students between neighborhoods to desegregate the schools. Metropolitan Los Angeles 1977 to 1981. Years after the so-called Watts riots, the Los Angeles schools were still segregated. And police officers regularly committed unprovoked acts of violence against black men. Michael Zinzen was a resident of Pasadena and a community activist. At one point before I met him in 1978, the police ganged up on him and beat him so badly that he lost one of his eyes. Zinzen was the founder of the Coalition Against Police Abuse. During my first year as minister of the Burbank Unitarian Fellowship, there was another example of excessive police force. LAPD officers chased a black teenager in one of the suburban neighborhoods in the San Fernando Valley. He was running through backyards, and the officer shot and killed him as he climbed over a fence. There are many other examples of police use of excessive force during the three plus years I spent in Los Angeles. There's no need to list them all. 10 years after I had left the city in 1991, Rodney King was beaten by police even after he was on the ground and not resisting them. And once again, Los Angeles residents rose up in protest. Los Angeles this week. This past Wednesday, in response to George Floyd's murder in Minneapolis, protesters blocked streets and at least one highway and a few individuals reportedly threw rocks at highway patrol cars. And the demonstrations have spread from Minneapolis where they started to Los Angeles and other major cities and smaller cities around this nation. Highland Park, New Jersey, 1981-82. When I left Los Angeles in 1981, I relocated to the leafy academic suburb of Highland Park to serve as minister of the nearby Unitarian Society of New Brunswick. Not long after I moved from North Hollywood to Highland Park, a teenager stole a bottle of liquor from a store a block or so from my apartment. Police officers pursued him on foot. He hid under a porch down the block. One of the officers 
pointed his service revolver under the porch and fired, killing the young man. Orange, New Jersey, 1999. I was still commuting between New Jersey, New Jersey shore town of Long Branch and the city of Orange when police officer Joyce Carnegie was killed with her service revolver by a man who had overpowered her. Earl Fison was arrested as a suspect. Five officers, three white, two black, took Faison into a stairwell of police headquarters and beat him, literally to death. He died in custody. Another suspect, Terence Everett, was held for six days before he was released. When he was released, he stated that he had been beaten. The actual shooter was eventually arrested and pled guilty. But not before one innocent man was arrested and died and another innocent man was arrested and beaten while in police custody. There are many more stories of excessive use of force by police and many more recent stories. These are just the most vivid of my personal memory. But I'm going to say something that displeases some of my radical friends. I'm going to say that police do a very difficult and necessary job and my experience is that many do it well and honorably. I have worked directly with police in Burbank, the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and Orange, New Jersey. In Orange, I had met police officer detective Kieran Shields once or twice. He was killed in the line of duty in 2006. Like Joyce Carnegie and the majority of my city's residents, he was African American. Now, Orange did not blow up, perhaps because of the population, perhaps because of a more open, though far from perfect relationship between the police and the citizenry. And I say, of course, not perfect because there were then and still are problems. My point this morning is this. What police, the media, and many politicians call riots in Minneapolis, what they called riots in Los Angeles and in Boston, what they called riots in Newark and many other cities are what I call, and many people from those places call, civil uprisings. Harrisburg had its own in 1969. These uprisings are the pained and desperate cries and actions of people who felt and still feel the knee of oppression on their necks. What I and many others call civil uprisings are the response of people to years, decades, and even centuries of structural racism. I'm not approving violent or destructive behavior. I'm explaining why it is understandable that people get angry and rise up in protest and Sad to say, sometimes themselves become violent. It is as if we as a nation, one event after another like this happens, it is as if we have more yet to learn from the history of civil uprisings or, and from the work of peaceful civil rights actions. There's a long history of racism in this nation. It is part of this nation's DNA. This is the reason why Black Lives Matter arose and was necessary, prompted when George Zimmerman killed 17-year-old Trayvon Martin while the teenager was walking home from a 7-Eleven in Sanford, Florida in 2012. Trayvon Martin was not the first nor the last innocent black man killed by police, but his death prompted the phrase in the movement Black Lives Matter, and this week in Minneapolis, there's further proof that we still have to say it. Black Lives Matter. White Americans collectively are slow learners. 
Many religious liberals have been in this struggle for racial justice for a long, long time, and we had to learn a lot to be able to join the struggle. And sometimes it took a while to learn what we had to learn. And we who are white are still learning, even if we have been in the struggle for a long, long time. Justice is a central principle of Unitarian Universalism. And that is why, that is why every day, every day, I am still learning how deeply ingrained racism is in our nation, how hard the struggle is to dismantle it, and how hard we have to work to educate ourselves and to move forward. The Legrone Scholarship Program is part of the work that needs to be done and is part of the work for which the people of the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg can be justly proud. It may not seem that radical, but enabling a young person to get an education and have the potential to become a leader, that is radical. This congregation does good and important work, but we must never let ourselves feel comfortable with what we are doing now. We are still learning, and we are still learning that there is so much more we need to do. Amen. Blessed be. Even as you are separated and sitting in your own homes today, the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg is still a freely gathered church of free people. The church is created, sustained, and supported by you. The ministry continues even when the building is closed. This week and through the month of June, we will share our offering with the Oliver Legrone Scholarship Fund. Oliver Legrone was a poet, sculptor, and educator, a member of the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg. The fund supports four-year scholarships for high school graduates from the city of Harrisburg so that they may continue their education at the post-secondary level. In a few minutes, Rick Hawley will tell you more about the fund, and you will hear from this year's scholar, Christina Ledesma. On the page below the screen, you can find directions for making a contribution online during this service or after. Please be generous. current chairperson of the Oliver Legrone Scholarship Committee. The Legrone Scholarship is named after a good friend of the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg, Mr. Oliver Legrone, who passed from this life just under 25 years ago. Although I have no personal memory of Mr. Legrone, several of our members still recall fondly his artistic, poetic, and interpersonal skills. 
You're probably most familiar with Legrone's sculpture of Harriet Tubman, which resides in our church lobby on Clover Lane. This year's scholarship selection panel met via video conference on Zoom. Selection panel members that served this year were UCH members Linda Deal and Kate Quimby, and our community member, Dr. Eric Selby. The panel members took their task quite seriously and worked diligently to select someone who they felt was deserving of the Legrone Scholarship. Sadly, this year we did not have the opportunity to interview the candidates in person, and as an issue of fairness, we did not conduct online interviews because not all of the candidates had the technology available to them at the time. The financial wellness of the Oliver Legrone Scholarship depends almost exclusively on the generosity of you, our members. This year, we had a setback in that our fundraiser, the annual book shuffle, was canceled due to the COVID-19 crisis. Please consider a generous donation to the scholarship by making your check payable to the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg with the words Oliver Legrone Scholarship written into the memo line. The selection panel this year has named Christina Ledesma, a senior at SciTech campus of Harrisburg High School, as the 2020 Oliver Legrone Scholar. Dr. Karen Maya has graciously agreed to serve as Christina's mentor through the, uh, throughout the scholarship program. The mentor role gives the Legrone Scholar someone with whom to consult with about dealing with the bureaucracy of institutions of higher learning, someone with whom to discuss their progress in school, and a new friend with life experience to share that often helps the scholar to negotiate the curves of the educational and life process. We wish Christina the best and know that with Karen as her mentor, she should be well equipped to face college this fall. I want to thank all of the members of the Oliver, Oliver Legrone Scholarship Committee and all of you who help us to maintain this important program to give back to our community and strive for a better tomorrow. And now, please take a moment to listen to our new 2020 Legrone Scholar, Christina Ledesma. Hello, everyone. My name is Christina Ledesma, and I am a senior at Harrisburg High School SciTech campus. This year, I was selected as the recipient for the Oliver Legrone Scholarship, which is a great honor to me. I feel so much gratitude to you, the scholarship committee, and members of the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg for helping me achieve my goals. Higher education means so much to my family and I. It is going to be the key to a better future for us, not only financially, but the knowledge that I will obtain will also help me. It is unfortunately expensive though, and I cannot afford it alone. I truly appreciate your aid for the next four years and I will do my absolute best to succeed in college and beyond. I also want to thank you for going an extra mile and finding a mentor to guide me. Since I am a first generation student, my parents cannot give me advice when it comes to college. Some things were confusing to me this year, like FAFSA and applying for colleges, but I have wonderful counselors and teachers, such as Mr. Rano, Mr. Hosey, Dr. Rossi, and Ms. Smith, who helped me. So I value this additional support. I am very thankful to my parents as well, who have, endured, who have worked long hours making little over minimum wage and endured a lot of manual labor in factories and fields for my sister and me. I love them so much and I will continue to work hard to make sure that their efforts will not be in vain. Even though this is a bleak time, I am so excited for the future and attending Shippensburg University. I am going to be a part of their honors program and study accounting at their business school. Additionally, the people that are helping me right now with college and during the pandemic have inspired me. During college and afterwards, I plan to keep volunteering, continue to be an activist, and work for charity organizations. Once again, thank you for this offer opportunity and please stay safe, everyone. Please join in singing our closing hymn answering the call of love.
We will not extinguish the chalice to mark the conclusion of worship. The screen will fade, but keep the chalice burning in your mind's eye. Our benediction is a poem by Langston Hughes. I look at the world from awakening eyes in a black face, and this is what I see. This fenced off narrow space assigned to me. I look at the silly walls through dark eyes and a dark face, and this is what I know. That all these walls oppression builds will have to go. I look at my own body with eyes no longer blind, and I see that my own hands can make the world that's in my mind. Then let us hurry, comrades, the road to find. To which I say, Amen.